you all know Joan Snyder, a uh, leading free artist with uh, a number of accolades, which uh, go everywhere from MacArthur Fellow, Guggenheim Fellow, uh, 2016 Academy of Arts and Letters Award recipient, among others. Her works reside in numerous museums, the Museum of Modern Art, New York, the Whitney, the Guggenheim, Art Institute of Chicago, etc. They're everywhere, and they're placed in important locations in those museums. They're usually on view and are appreciated by lots of people on the Instagrams. Uh, Jenny Sorgan, curatorial powerhouse. This conversation uh, has really given this rise to reinterpreting art that has been not quite looked at properly for a very long time mainly art by women that has now been put into the forefront and that's in large part to this woman right here. Um, the show you've all probably seen down the road, um, Evolution of Making, it's fabulous. Nothing short of fabulous. And I'm really honored to have you guys speaking here. Thanks. These are the mics for the audience. Oh, okay. Right. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Joan. Anyone hear that? Yes. Can I tell them how I met you? Absolutely. I'm already taking it away from your... That's good. Many years ago when Jenny was working with Connie Butler to curate the um, wax show, she was possibly 25. I mean, really a kid. And um, she called me on the phone, and I happened to be in Woodstock at the time, and she was at Bard, and she needed to interview me for, I think for possibly being in the show, or, or perhaps I was chosen, or I can't remember. I liked your work, and I wanted to meet you. Right. <laughs> it was even simpler than that. <laughs> so I thought, who is, who is this kid I'm talking to on the phone? Anyway, I went across the river, and met Jenny, and I mean, I was so blown away. It was probably the best interview I had ever had. And um, I mean, it, li it literally was by a kid, um, but she was so smart and I was so impressed. Our history goes on. I mean, several years later, I asked her to write an essay in my Abrams book. Um, I had already um, chosen Hayden Herrera as the essayist, but I wanted a younger voice, so I asked Jenny to write the other essay, which she did. Anyway, that's the beginning. And, and, all, and, and, and it goes on, and so we've had a, a dialogue for the past 12 years, I'd say, and, and it's, um, it's been an honor to get to think about your work over a long period of time, uh, but it's really nice to see your work back on this coast, because one of your earliest shows was actually on the West Coast in San Francisco, in 1970 at Michael Wall's gallery. Yeah. Could you talk about what it meant to sort of show your work on this coast, being an, an East Coaster or New Yorker? You mean at Michael's? Yeah. The first thing that I remember about my show at Michael's is that um, Larry Fink, who was my husband at the time, um, took a photograph of me sort of splayed out on my studio couch and Michael used it as the announcement and the announcement said well, it was a terrific photograph of me it was fine it is. that wasn't the bad part <laughs> the bad part was Michael announced it as first one man show <laughs> <laughs> and it was already in print so needless to say I went ballistic um, and I think you're wearing overalls in that picture De um, like denim overalls, and, and there's a real kind of connotation in the art world about overalls and labor. Uh, it's kind of a thing that some of the minimalists like Carl Andre used to do. I'm not saying you, you did it for that reason at all, but I think that this... No, no, they weren't overalls. They were striped blue jeans. Okay, striped blue um, jeans. Anyway, we should... So I don't even remember if I went to that Michael Walls first show. I, I have a feeling I didn't go. 
So I can't really talk about it that much. Um, but then I, I know I, had, I was in a museum show in Los Angeles, um, and I'd really have to look at my resume to tell you what it was, but it was a museum show that I had. Nicholas Wilder. Well, Nick, Nick Wilder, I never had a show with Nick, but Nick set that show up. Um, yeah. Wow, that's really touching to know. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that. But yeah, I was going to have a show with Nick, and I really loved Nick, you know, but then, I mean, he died pretty young, yeah. So what did it feel like as a, as a woman artist to get commercial attention and recognition pretty early on in a, in a world that was fairly hostile to women artists? Could you talk a little bit about that? Because you got very active in the feminist movement as well in the 70s. Um, I think when I first started showing with Paley and Lowe, um, I don't think I was thinking about that so much. I remember that, you know, I, I really had some pretty lucky breaks. I mean, Marsha Tucker came to my studio early on in the early 70s and absolutely loved my work and wrote a very big article about my work in Art Forum, um, which was kind of a major thing. And then she told... And she put you in the Grids show. Was that her? That there was a Grids show that you were in very early on. I, I don't... Yes, I don't remember if it was Marcia, though. I think it was 70... I think it was her show. And then you were in the Whitney Annual, two years running. I think 70... Two and three, or one and two? One of the, I, I, it's early 70s. But you, you were in some major exhibitions that I would, group shows that gave your work a kind of prominence and but recognition. I, th I think the break for me was that Marcia told uh, Paley and Lowe about me. And they were just beginning opening a new gallery and um, they took me on. I mean, so that, you know, I don't, I don't know if there was an issue about me being a woman or not being a woman. I mean, this was a partnership. One was a man, one was a woman, Jill and Lowe, uh, you know, and what was his name, Paley? I forgot I his first name. Yeah. Jeff. Jeff, yeah. Anyway, um, I became in, involved in the women's art movement. I think probably initially I was in a consciousness raising group and um, a lot of women artists and curators were in that group. And it was just intense. And I think, I mean, I don't really remember exactly, but I think from there we sort of began speaking about women in the arts and, and starting a women's art movement. And <laughs> um, if you guys want seats, you're more than welcome to fill in the seats. We're not, we're not picky. You're, you're, not, you're not interrupting us. If people want to come sit, there's about seven seats up here and in the middle. So I was very involved in the women's art movement. And I, in fact, I went to Rutgers University um, and got my, I was a, an undergraduate Douglas majoring in sociology. And then I went to Rutgers University to get my MFA. Um, I had started painting as a senior in college and um, took a year off, much to my mother's chagrin, to paint and to, um, you know, I worked part time making money. And then I got into Rutgers, luckily, um, for three years. They, they, told me that I had to do one year non-matriculated because I had never taken, really only taken one art course in my life. And um, so I got my MFA in three years. That's when I began to have a consciousness about the fact that A, there were no female teachers in the art department at all. Um, and there were, a lot of women, you know, studying, and B, 
that I could never get a job there. And even, even years later, I mean, when I tried to get a job at Rutgers, I mean, it took many, many years before they started hiring women. I mean, it was a long time. And this was a, actually one of the sort of disparities that's been permanent in the art world for a long time, that, that something like, even to this day, something like 80% of all art students are women, uh, and yet the, there's a real disparity in terms of who gets to show on the other side of art school. Um, there are now people who, you know, in, in the generation after, let's say, the Gorilla Girls, there's, a, there's an artist here in LA named, named Nicole Hebron who's been documenting uh, sort of the prevalence of lack of solo exhibitions and actually trying to chart this as her own conceptual practice um, about the lack of solo shows accorded to women in the New York art world and in the art world in general, but that, that art students historically have been women uh, and that they don't go on, they, they were pushed instead of to MFA programs, a lot of them were pushed into early childhood or art education programs and that that became the comparative for, that was the strategy for where women could funnel their artistic uh, energy was into, into early childhood education or into teaching. I think we, yeah, I mean, we know all that. Um, that, you know, that there's a terrible glass ceiling. I mean, you know, it, it exists, it still exists, it's not gonna go away. I don't think it's gonna go away. Um, the only other thing I would add before we start talking about the work is that one of the things that I did do that I'm really proud of is that in the early 70s, I decided that because there were no teachers at Rutgers and at Douglas, no, no women teachers, that the women students needed role models, the undergraduates, whether they were art students or not, they needed to see work by women. So I started the Women's Artist Series. It's now called the Mary H. Dana Women's Artist Series, and it's, believe it or not, still going on. I mean, I, I, have, I question whether it even should still be going on, but it is still going on. But in the very beginning of starting that series, and it really was the first women's art program in the country where women artists were shown and women artists talked about their work. Um, I remember like the first few years I curated the shows and I had Louise Bourgeois, I had Mary Heilman, I had, um, I think Pat Steer had a show, I had a show. Um, People who actually became quite well known after years later, but um, you know, the first few years I did it, I would have the women come down to to talk, and I remember the very first time there were like three or four students came, you know, and then maybe six or seven students came. By the third year, the place was packed, but but it did take a few years. Anyway, we could go on and on talking about the women, you know, women in the art world, but. Let's talk about the work. Okay. So Joan has been making very sensuous mixed media paintings uh, that I think are, are really um, set apart by their narrative potential, that there's a really strong narrative element in the work. Um, there is, uh, her work really works um, in many ways off uh, a loose grid um, and there is uh, a grid-like structure that underlies the way in which she produces um, the process for making the work. And I, I'd really like her to, to, I'd like to talk partially today about how she goes about um, structuring her canvases because there's a whole lot of process uh, behind each one. Um, but there, there's groupings that we could say that early, a lot of the early work um, are these stroke paintings that she's best known for early on and the, there's one in the very front room when you walk into the gallery, an early stroke painting from 1971 um, in which she's almost staining uh, the canvas um, with these different densities of paint and it really becomes this elemental gesture of the stroke. Uh, and the stroke reinforces the relationship in the sense to um, the manual potential of the body uh, and the body uh, making the work, the hand in the work. Um, there's a brush stroke, uh, which 
the brush stroke goes in and out of painting as being sort of the, the apotheosis of, of a painter's labor, um, where people later on try to bury their brush strokes. They don't want you to see all of the, the work involved. Um, and then somebody like Joan, who really proliferates um, and expands and uses her stroke in the most expressive way possible. Um, and you see a litany of strokes, um, and you see them in various forms um, as they change over the years. You see long strokes at the very beginning, and throughout this show, for example, there's a lot of short strokes um, that sometimes take on uh, different um, shapes. Um, but there's a, a symbolism, uh, symbolisms that Joan has been um, really invested in throughout her work uh, in terms of the sort of the oblique body or the, the content of the body that comes out in the flesh-like paint forms. Um, there's also uh, paintings about nature and sort of nature as a metaphor for the, fe the fecundity of the female body, I would say, um, and the relationship of uh, the body and the earth. Um, and there's a real presence of uh, femininity to the work in thinking about uh, the way in which women's painting looks different um, in an unabashed, unapologetic way than men's painting. And I think Joan has always been this uh, an early progenitor of being unapologetic about her content and her subject matter as profoundly feminine. Um, and also working through historic styles of painting, let's say, um, in the fashion of the grid um, and making landscapes. Um, there's a whole bunch of paintings called field paintings, for example, that um, sometimes look like fields and sometimes are grids and sometimes are collaged with other kinds of um, mixed media work on top of them. Uh, there's also symphony paintings. Um, there's a whole bunch of paintings, um, even here today, that have a relationship in some way to musicality. Um, and the idea of almost um, conducting form, we might say, where you become the, the conductor of the, the grand gesture. And the gesture ultimately comes down once again to the brush stroke in many ways. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this. Help! <laughs> uh, oh my God. <laughs> and my grandson would say, oh my God. <laughs> I think what we could do is come back to uh, your process itself and this elemental form of the stroke uh, that, that seems to carry through. Um, you have this basic brush stroke form that comes up again and again, and it's paired with a grid in some way, that that's one of the, the earliest structures that continues on in the work, the brush stroke and the grid. <laughs> Could, could you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> I don't know if I think about it as the brush stroke and the grid. Um, well, then push back and tell me how it's not like that at all. Well, what, what I wanted to, I mean, there, of course, they're brush strokes. It's, I'm, I have a brush and I'm painting. <laughs> so there's going to be brush strokes. Um, but it's not that basic. It's what? It's not that basic. It's more complex. And you have in front of you this, I'm going to just narrate this sketchbook that I can't quite understand. But what Joan does is she plans her paintings in many ways. And they come through this process of keeping a sketchbook. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to talk about how I, um, where these ideas come from, or where my paintings come from, or my process which is most often it begins with going to a concert. So I like to listen to a lot of music. Um, I'm more often found at a concert than I am at a museum or at a gallery show. Um, I'm more inspired by music, I think, than anything else. And I learn for, more from music than anything else, just listening to music. And when I work, I always listen to music. I mean, there's always something running. And, and often, when I'm getting into a certain series of paintings, I will listen to the same four CDs over and over and over again. 
But what happens is that I'll be at a concert and it's really just a place for me to be in a very meditative state. Um, and I'll have my sketch pad out and, and needless to say, after 40 or 45 years of working, one thing does lead to another. It's not like something's coming out of the blue. Um, but I'll make a sketch and then, you can't really see this from where you are, but for example, this is a really, really detailed um, sketch that I'll make initially, and then I'll go back to it over and over and over again, many times before I make the paintings. So that my sketches are usually two years ahead of my paintings, um, sometimes more. Like this is a sketch for a very large sunflower painting that actually I haven't done yet. Um, I just did not do that this winter. I almost did it, but um, the initial sketch began in December of 2012. And then what I'll do is I'll say, every time I look at this, I'll date it like August 2014. Um, 2000, for February 2013, I say, yes, gorgeous. I mean, I always say, yes, 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 yes. And then I'll add ideas. I mean, if I have enough yeses on here, you know, at some point then I'm ready to really do that painting. And this sketchbook is just full of that sort of thing, you know, where I, I, I mean, I actually edit myself very carefully. Sometimes they look like, oh, you know, that happened quickly or overnight, but it's, it's just not so. I mean, they, I really think about these things. I make tons of notes about what I'm gonna do. Um, you know, sometimes it's, there was one note that I really liked that I was gonna read. I mean, sometimes it's, where is it? On this page. This is a painting that I had in my last show. It was called Requiem Redo. And I make notes for myself. It says, leave it there, which means don't touch that painting. And of course I do touch that painting. It says, so I have notes from December 25th. It says, rougher with flesh figure at bottom and earth with rosebuds for black symphony, blue drawn flowers, black, Glitter, black print, dark, yellow sunflowers in left middle corner as in photo placed. You know, I make tons and tons of notes for myself about one painting. Old black woodcut faces also look at stages of Our Lady of Brooklyn. That's another painting that I made. Um, anyway, this goes, you know, the paintings don't just happen spontaneously, although some of these did. The very first painting on the corner on the right really came from that first sketch I showed you of the sunflower painting. But it's just a, you know, that's a smaller painting, um, just kind of doing one little part of that drawing in that painting, um, because I wanted to explore that before I did a big painting. I mean, I felt like before I jump into this huge painting that I had in my mind, I was gonna do a few smaller things relating to it. And it's so interesting that so many of your sketches contain, as do many of your paintings, text. That there's a real commitment to language here in terms of describing. You're describing to yourself what it is, the specificity of the materials and sometimes the form and you know, the area of the canvas, like lower left corner. Uh, what does it mean to work so verbally um, through abstraction? Well, interestingly enough, none of these paintings have text on them. Right. You know, the text thing, I really do like, I write in paintings only when I feel like I can't do it any other way. When there's something I really, really want to say and I cannot say it any other way but with text. Um, for years, I think that when I used text, they called me a feminist painter, and, and I kind of hated that. You know, I did, I did not want to be labeled. I mean, if Julian Schnabel writes in a painting, he's called a hero, because isn't he sensitive? Isn't he wonderful? He's writing in a painting. 
when I would write in a painting, they would call me a feminist, you know, so, which was a dirty word at the time. Um, anyway, I, I do like to write in the paintings, and, um, but I don't always do it, you know. These paintings, I think, this series of paintings that, that you see here, including the one in the office, was done over a five-month period. That's it. I mean, I think I started it in late October and I finished in mid-March when they picked them up. <laughs> um, it's a lot of work in, in, in that short a time, but I was really just working every day, almost all day, and loving it. I mean, I was really, really deeply involved in these paintings. Because for me, there was something very exciting happening. I mean, I was kind of taking the, you know, all the landscape ideas and the, first of all, let me just backtrack, which is to say that the show I had right before that at Franklin's Gallery in New York, um, really three years of work. And it was very, very intense, heavy, heavy handed, heavy hearted, um, beautiful nonetheless work that I was involved in. And, and it was really about mourning something very, very deep. And I wrote my own essay for the catalog because I did not want anyone else to write the essay. Um, I did not want anybody else to go near the subject matter. So I wrote the essay. Um, that took three years, that, that body of work. Then I started working in October, and much to my surprise, I mean, no one was more surprised than I was by how kind of light they were in a way, and how, how they, they were so different than the, the, the work that I had done before. And I got very involved in the idea of this landscape and the dried flowers, but keeping everything, you know, like this thin veil of paint and layer and layer and layer of the thin veil of paint. I mean, except for this one, which really is kind of different than the other ones in, in the way I approached it. But then, you know, adding on top of that these, these bits of color, you know, which really did remind me of the stroke paintings. I mean, it was like going back in a way, but in a very different way, because these are all laid on with a palette knife and they're laid on thickly. And it's not like the stroke paintings, which really were, um, I was very much involved in a stroke, get, making it thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. So, you know, it's like a process. Um, so what does that mean between the sort of the thin washes early on and then this kind of, I mean, over, you've always built up surfaces, but there's this real tactility to your surfaces where you collage organic, obviously organic materials onto the canvas um, that are dried um, and yet don't have that uh, dried pressed Victorian, Victoriana flower quality where they're nostalgic in some way. They're sort of, uh, they get covered over in paint to the point of non-recognition. Like we don't know what's a sunflower and what's a seed or a seed pod. Um, so could you, could you talk a bit about the surface quality and, and this tactility, or the, the pull toward collaging objects onto the canvas? You know, I almost can't talk about it. I mean, I like to do it. <laughs> and you talk about it. Um, but you know, I mean, my studio is full of herbs and dried flowers and, you know, I mean, this is what I love to, I've always used collage, I've always pasted and glued, and, and um, I like that kind of surface, and I've used berries and cherries and... and um, seeds. Seeds and beads and, you know, I mean, this has um, rosebuds all around this kind of ceramic frame. Um, and the rosebuds are throughout, and then, and then these brown, brown pieces of material are um, Chinese herbs, actually, which I got many, many years ago from, I shared a, uh, a space. I mean, I had the big front part of the space and an acupuncturist had the other part. And at some point, the acupuncturist decided that she wanted to give her patients 
capsules instead of herbs because they were too dirty, you know, and people had to cook them and everything instead of swallow them. So she gave me all her Chinese herbs. And I actually, this was like 20 years ago or something, I still have some herbs that I, so I still use them in paintings in different ways. And is it that they, are they symbolic of that medicinal healing? Well, for a few years, I actually was making healing paintings. This was years ago, in the 80s, I think. No, then I stopped doing that and just started using it as material. Yeah. Because sometimes the materials are beyond recognition, that you don't know that it's rose petals necessarily, or you don't know what kind of, you don't know that it's a sunflower, but if you read the materials list, sometimes it alludes to that. Right. Poppy pods, um, you know, which I collect in Woodstock after the poppies dry out. Do you, do you relate these sort of seeds and the structures of the pods? Is that a metaphor for femininity or for the female or no? I don't think about that. You know, I am that, but I don't really think consciously think about that, no. Um, But in the past, you have talked about and been quoted extensively about this idea of women, women's bodies, um, the idea of painting differently, representing the world differently, and having this, this outlook that's profoundly different and needed in, in paint. From early on, I always believed that there was such a thing as a female sensibility. You know, that, that our experiences are different, our bodies are different, our lives end up being very different. And if we're gonna write or make art, or it's gonna be different than what a man is gonna do. It doesn't mean that the sensibilities don't cross each other, because I think they do. I mean, I think there are plenty of men who have those sensibilities as well. But I do think that, you know, a lot of this dialogue was from the early 70s which is that in the early 70s, minimalism wasn't speaking to us. Color field painting certainly wasn't speaking to me and, and to many of us. Um, there began to be a narrative element going on. There began to be an element of materiality. I mean, women were using materials in paintings. They were being autobiographical. They were telling their stories. They had no other way to speak. I mean, they were really, and, and I, I knew this because I became well-known as a painter in the early 70s. So anytime a college needed a woman to come and speak to the students, I couldn't get a job at a university, but they hired me to come to Kansas and here and there and everywhere to speak to the women students. So you were token. So I was a token, but I, you know, I made money. I mean, I traveled. I, I couldn't get a teaching job, but that was one way that I earned a living. And also it was interesting. So I would walk into a woman's studio and I would look, I would just walk in and I would say, oh my God, that's incredible. You know, I would see things that were incredible. And the student would inevitably say to me, really? But my teacher doesn't get it. Who's your teacher? My teacher's a man. I mean, of course your teacher's not gonna get it. It was a whole new visual language that was going on that, you know, as I traveled around the country, I began to see it, and I think that on the West Coast, I'm sure Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro began to see it, Lucy Lepard, you know, and then, and then it became a dialogue about what's going on, you know, what are we doing, what are we all, how come our work is somehow different than, than other work that's going on? Um, I mean, for me, that's how the whole dialogue began because I, I actually saw it. I mean, it wasn't something that came out of the sky. I mean, I saw what was going on around the country. But then what does it mean to, in 2016 to embrace um, and create a canvas like this one that, that has, I think it's the title of the whole show, Woman Song? I mean, that's, a, that's an unabashed feminist uh, kind of, um, I don't know, there's a pride in that. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a gender in the canvas because you've gendered it through the titling. What does that mean to do even if, even if there's, you know, 
even if you backed away from maybe the full-on feminist activism that, that isn't necessarily embodied in this era, what does it mean in 2016 to make a canvas called Woman's Song? Well, you know, that just happened. I mean, the figure in Lady over there, the, there's a figure at the bottom, there's her lips, there's a breast. I mean, you have to look carefully, but there is a figure there, um, and she's kind of all over the painting in a way. It really just happened. I mean, I was painting the painting, and suddenly at the bottom, and I might have been inspired, believe it or not, by my assistant, Mira Dancy, who's a, who's a figurative painter. Um, and I said, you know, she and I go back and forth about putting figures in paintings, and suddenly I was putting this figure in the painting, because I've always, over the years, put female figures in my paintings. Um, and with this one, the same thing was happening. I mean, you know, I had this kind of lavender paint, and it got on the brush, and I suddenly started making these muse, you know, my muse, my female figure um, in the painting, and there's big lips on top, and, you know, I think it had a face on there that my muse came into the studio and told me to get rid of the face. <laughs> she didn't like the face. It actually had a face, but I got rid of the face. I don't usually listen, but I listened. But, it um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, it wasn't as if I was thinking I'm going to make a painting about women. I'm going to make a show called Women's Song. Woman's Song, the show came, Franklin and I figured out that title. When we, he called me and said, what are we going to call the show? And we were brain, brainstorming, and suddenly I thought of the name of the painting, Woman's Song, and he said, perfect. You know, and that, that became the title, I mean, of the show. So, and it really worked. I do, you know, I do embrace um, the female sensibility. I embrace the fact that I'm a feminist. I, you know, none of that is hidden, but it's not something that I think about or, I don't know, I mean, it's just... Meaning it's not a conscious agenda. It sort of bubbles up like a spring, like a wellspring that comes up over and over as a, as a kind of guiding... I mean, you're drawn to painting fragmented female body parts, perhaps, in, in, in various ways. And, that's, but, and that's, a, that's a real sensibility in terms of... I think it's part of my language. I mean, I think, I think that comes up. You know, I think it comes up just like, you know, other things come up. Um, you know, like the meditation squares. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that that's part of, part of who I am, part of my language, part of what I've always done over the years. I mean, I was doing it in the late 60s. I was doing it. You did it. paint very figurative body parts for a while. Yeah. And, and some of them were sort of flat, almost like a Tom Wesselman mat. Well, I did that in graduate school, yeah. Those have never been seen. But they're they been reproduced. In, they're hiding in storage. Um, but I did, yeah. Jenny knows the work. But there's a, there's a real flesh-like sensibility, even if you're not depicting the body, per se, that, that the paint becomes almost a, a metaphor for flesh in some way, that there's this tactility and sensuality and that uh, sensual materials produce, you know, sensual, for sensual forms, ultimately, in the work. What was that, central? Sensual materials produce sensual forms. Central materials produce central forms. Yes, I think. I don't know what that means. Um, well, but there's, a, there, 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 there's not... Um, the sensuality is through the tactility that comes through in the materials that, that you're layering over and over again. There's this constant layering and reworking the surface, that the surface becomes bodily in some way as you rework it. I, I mean, I, I'm not a painter. I don't know. You tell me. No, I mean, you have to tell me because you're the writer. I mean, you're the art critic. I, you, you know, you're the curator. I, I mean, all that is true. But that doesn't mean that I walk into the studio feeling that or thinking that. I walk in just as me, you know, in the morning and I go to work. And I listen to music and, and I look at my sketchbook and I, 
you know, there's lots of poetry in there, and there's poetry in the music I listen to, and and um, and it moves me, and it and it drives me. I mean, I I'm kind of driven. Um, it's you know, there is a kind of magic that happens. You you don't you can't always put it in words. You know, it's like it's like you start a painting, and you know, it's slow process in the beginning, and then you just sort of have to go on automatic pilot. And my automatic pilot is this language that I've built up over many, many years. And the language serves me really well. You know, it's, and, and the vocabulary is huge. And depending on what I want to say or what I want to talk about, it's there for me. I mean, I'm really lucky. I mean, I don't, I don't um, you know, I don't have painter's block or, you know, any of that kind of thing. I mean, I do take sometimes a few months off between shows just to, just to uh, get over the whole business thing, you know, and the whole public thing and the whole, you know, whatever. But I can never wait to get back in my studio again. Because as Maggie tells me that I'm crazy when I'm not painting, <laughs> so I need to be painting so that I'm not crazy. Because when I'm in the studio, I really am much emotionally much more, I'm better. Did that help? Yeah, it did. You have this line that you said somewhere about how your work, I think it's written on a canvas or maybe a drawing, but that your work has been absolutely faithful to you. And, and that, that seems to embody That's what you're a, saying. Written in a woodcut. In a woodcut. Yeah. Okay. My work uh, has been absolutely faithful to me. And that's true. And I always remember that line. And, and it feels like a, almost a manifesto of, of, but also a real tenacity as well. A, a commitment on both sides between you and this thing you create. Um, I'm wondering if we, we have about uh, a few minutes here. I think we're almost at the end and there's some people who want to ask questions and they've been very patient. Would you mind if we turn this over? Sure. To our audience? Questions would be fine. Um, you came, I was a student in Hell Arts in the early 70s when you came to speak. And do you want to pass the mic? Well, Uh, I was a student at Cal Arts in the early 70s when you came to speak, and your talk was so pivotal for me in my life uh, because you spoke so differently about your work, how you related to your work, um, the absolutely unembarrassed um, of painterliness, the painterly um, vocabulary, and it's just rung in my head every day in my studio. Wow. Ever since then, and it was really important to me. I wasn't seeing work like yours. Um, it wasn't that the fact that you were a woman artist. There were a lot of other women artists who came to speak, but it was how you related to your work, how it meant to you, and the meaning that was imbued um, with it. And um, I really um, admire too when you could hear to me that how the persistence of you um, within your work and being able to um, keep with it all this time. That wasn't a question. <laughs> Somebody back there. John has a question. What kind of music do you listen to? Yeah. For this series. This is a guy I've known since he was a baby. He's the brother of my very best, one of my very best friends who died a couple years ago. Um, what kind of music do I I listen to mostly, I would say, vocal classical music. Um, world music. I listen to Amy Winehouse, Laurie Anderson, Philip Glass, um, women vocal singers, Nina Simone, stuff like that. Yes. Um, question about the Hell Arts. Did you study sociology and then took up painting as a senior? Um, and so I'm interested in both how you recognize the creative impulse, but also on the aspect of stroke. Was there something else that you had previously done, some physical activity, dancing, whatever, where being expressive with your body um, was part of your repertoire of just who you were, whether it was sport or... So this was really where it all came to 
Jesus? I don't think so. Um, you know, I was, I was an athlete when I was in high school. But I, you know, I was studying sociology and I just took a, happened to take a painting course. I mean, I really wanted to, somewhere in my head was the idea that I wanted to take a painting course. And, um, and I did, and that's really where it all began. I mean, I made a painting, it was actually of my brother and sister-in-law who happened to be here. And my painting teacher came up to me and said, how do you like Yavolensky? And I, of course, had never ha heard of Yavolensky. I'd never been to a museum even. Um, and he, he took me up to the slide room and showed me German and Russian expressionism. And of course, I'm from a German-Russian background. And all that work just so totally moved me and spoke to me. And it, and it really did relate to what I had been doing, but I didn't know about it. So that's where it began. I mean, it had nothing to do with movement or music or anything like that. Somebody in the back. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship to color? How important is color for you? And how do you decide what colors to use in a painting? I see a lot of yellows. And just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I think that I choose my colors in the art supply store. I mean, that's really where color happens for me. Um, if I have the idea of a series of work I want to do, you know, then I go into the store knowing sort of what I'm looking for. Um, for years, I, I think that I kind of hear colors. So music and sound and colors really all go together for me. Um, when I was very a young artist, I mean, I remember saying things like, yellow was anxiety. I don't think that that's true anymore. I mean, I, I really think that the color now comes from two places, the landscape and all the paint that I have. <laughs> I mean, I have so much paint from over the years. And, you know, sometimes I'll have my assistants organize it, and you know, and, and then I'll look at all this beautiful colors that I have that I've collected over the years. And you know, I mean, it, it might inspire me. I mean, one of the things that inspired all these pieces of color that are all over these paintings are all this incredible oil paint that I had sitting around. And I suddenly thought, I'm gonna use this, you know, which I hadn't been doing a lot of. Can I say? Yeah. I'm gonna just add one thing to that, which is that that hearing of color it has, a, has a real theoretical and psychological basis, and it, it's called synesthesia. Right. And so there's, right. a, there's, there's an actual literature on this for those of you who are very interested in it. Yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, this is more of a thank you than a question. Um, and I'm going to try and make it really smart. When I was five, I did a painting of a bunny. I, I was in school. And my bunny went on the board for the entire year of what not ever to paint. <laughs> so it did damage, no doubt about it. But I always loved art, and I always sought out art. And in the late 80s, I believe I went to New York, because so I would go there and gorge on art. And I saw your show, and I think this was so helpful. And it blew, I mean, I, I, I tried to explain to my friend who think that um, it touched me like nothing ever before or since. And I saw my bunny, is what I saw. <laughs> and so I go back to my hotel room and I keep going, I have to tell her how much it means to me. I have, she's heard it before, my old boy says. And I go, yeah, but I need to tell her. And the boy said, she's heard it. And finally a boy says, why don't you call her? So I said, oh, I will. So I called information. I got your number. <laughs> you have a Joan Schneider in Midtown somewhere, I think I said. And they said, well, we have one in Brooklyn. I said, OK. So I called you. And a woman answered the phone. And I said, may I speak with Joan Schneider? And you said, this is Joan. And I said, oh my God, I wrote, Joan, I'm Dakota Fisher, I'm in California, you don't know me, but I saw your show and I went on and on and on about it. 
And was that nice? You know, <laughs> you were in the middle of my my if you could stop me, you said, How did you get my number? <laughs> I had done no painting uh, yet. And I said to you, but what really caught me is that you were so uncensored and so unedited. And you said, well, that's actually not true. <laughs> and my heart fell to the ground because I knew I'd made a big faux pas. But because I hadn't painted yet, I didn't know what I was saying. But there was a passion, an emergency, an urgency to the work. And so at the end, I said, well, I saw my buddy. And you said, what was your name again? Do you remember this phone call at all? I've never stopped. You changed the whole trajectory of my life. I was a therapist. I went back to California. And one year, I closed both practices. And I've been painting ever since. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I don't think anybody can top that. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> like, no, no, that's not all about you. No, 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 I didn't want it to be, but it was so, so significant. I mean, I'm not, I didn't go around calling artists. I mean, except to be. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one or two more? Yeah. Um, what do your assistants do? What do my assistants do? <laughs> they mostly sit at the computer and deal with my database and my resumes and my packing things sometimes. And I don't know, there's a lot of data to deal with or, or requests or phone, you know, I don't know. I mean. They're not in the studio that much, although lately I've had a few straightening up because um, things got to be kind of messy because I was working so furiously. But they don't work on your canvases. Huh? They don't work on your canvases. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. They don't go near my canvases, nor do they, <laughs> nor do they stretch them. I mean, that's all done outside, and they, the, work, you know, the stretches come in stretched and pretty much primed. And, um, no, they don't work on the canvases, but, and I, my, you know, I have one assistant, and it's usually two days a week. So it's not, you know, a full-time assistant, but, you know, they deal with the gallery. The gallery has things that they need. They deal with historical stuff. I mean, they, my database goes back to the, you know, the mid-60s, and, and, you know, first there were slides, and there were digital images, so they're always scanning things, and, trying to get things up to date, stuff like that. Then we have lunch, you know. <laughs> it's always fun. Nick? Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, a big thank you to Joan and Jenny.